This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. Thanks for listening to Grilled by the Staff Canteen. Um, I'm Cara, editor of the Staff Canteen, and in this episode, I'm talking to Nuno Mendes and Bobby Groves from Chilton Firehouse. So Bobby is uh, head of oysters at the London restaurant and has uh, recently finished his first book, uh, Oyster Isles. I don't know if you uh, uh, might want to do like a little plug where people can actually get it from whilst they've got you there, Bobby. So uh, it's available everywhere. So the hardback is um, it came out one year ago today, and the paperback is has just come come out. So that's going to be Am- Amazon, Waterstones, W H Smith, which I think is really cool, and then. Um, uh, you know, you can go to your independent bookshop and stuff like that. So it's available everywhere in short. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to be going to WH Smith and putting your book at the front of the displays, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From a nostalgic point of view, I would love, yeah, WH Smith. This really means a lot because that's where I used to go and buy my little football magazines when I was like eight. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Nuno, uh, you're currently in Lisbon, is that correct? Yes. I am, I am in Lisbon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you're in the, um, sorry if I pronounced this wrong, the Barro Alto Hotel? Uh, uh, Barro Alto Hotel, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. I am, yeah. Um, and that's obviously where you've opened your your first um, restaurant in, in your hometown, which it's was my f- last year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my first project in Lisbon, which is uh, you know, a true honour to be able to uh, to do a project here, you know. Yeah, um, I've been working at it for a long time, and it's finally open. You know, well, now closed, but then reopening again soon. <laughs> yeah, well, you, not how you expected it. No, the well, first few you know, months. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm actually on that. So, traveling from London to Portugal is the situation and the atmosphere very, very different in Portugal to, to, to obviously where we are, or, or is it very much the same? Look, I've been very privileged. I've, I've, I've lived in Hackney for a long time, and in Hackney. Um, you know, the, the, there's a really nice energy, like nice, like neighborhood feel. Um, uh, uh, even, even, even like as soon as the lockdown finished, I mean, it's just like, you know, the neighborhood just came up, came, you know, came alive again. So it gave me a, perhaps like a false sense of, uh, of what, what the rest of London's going through. Uh, you know, like the, a lot of small businesses, a lot of local businesses, a lot of local support. Um, so things like are starting to pick up, obviously, like, you know, keeping in mind the new rules, regulations, social distancing, etc. Lisbon obviously um, is now a city that is is dependent heavily on tourism. So, um, just when I landed here, we're still under uh, the the UK rule of quarantine when you return. Yeah. So traveling to Lisbon was very very difficult for a lot of play, uh, people in Europe. As a result, the city was quieter. Um, but I must say that you know it is it is nice because it it brought me back memories of what what Lisbon was like in the in the sort of older days. Um, before before this that huge burst of tourism came through, you know at the same time it's negative because you know obviously it hurts. You know I mean people in the industry is like you know you know tourism basically they've, they've all they've all they've all been hurting a lot. Yeah. But um but it's coming it's, it's coming back up. I mean you can see the buzz, it, it, it's picking up again. And I think Lisbon's got a really long um, a really good long season. I mean like you, you know because the weather's so nice and um, it, it's such a pleasant city to be in. Um, you know, you can stay here until up, up to November, like the weather's still very, very nice. And then it picks up again in March. So like, you know, you have a very long, so, so you have, you have a, lot of, a lot of different types of tours. And you have the younger generations and then you have the older generations coming in. So it keeps it going. So yes, I mean, yeah. I'm positive about it. And we're yeah. about to open, we're, we're reopening on the 1st of, uh, 1st of September. We reopened the, the hotel again. Yeah. Well, the restaurant's first and then the hotel on the 23rd. Yeah, sorry. Because you said no, because you. Said, I was just going to say because we've been chatting obviously pre this this interview, and you said that you're in the hotel on on your own, which is a bit a bit the it's, shining, isn't it? It's like the shining. Like the, <laughs> there's a security guard that I still haven't seen, and then there's me, <laughs> and um, there's a full bar, full kitchen. It's pretty crazy. I mean, All you need look, is some twins now. <laughs> I, well, well, you know, I have twins as well. You know that. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm all sorted for that. <laughs> Brilliant. They're not here, They're not here. Fucking thank God. Oh, that, that would be terrifying if they just turned up unannounced at the end of the corridor. Shit, oh, you know, <laughs> fucking hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, So, how are you finding operating restaurants in in different countries then? Because, like you said, Portugal is very different to London so um how, how have you found that look I mean you know to be honest it's I mean it really is about the team right I mean like you know we've had you know in, in London you know you know I have amazing amazing you know dear friends like like Bobby and Richard 
um, and Hamish and, and and you know a lot of people that I that I, that I care for a lot, um, a huge team of people that I trust, um, that I that I've that I've worked with for a long time and and that have really always like um, you know they've been very passionate about it, and that's 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 allowed me to basically do that. I mean I can't I, you know I can't I can't micromanage a project if I'm like not there, twenty four yeah. hours a day. So and in Lisbon's the same. I build a really nice team, and, and so I, I managed to to come in and out and 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 be able to do things and be able to push things forward. But we have you know we have we have a lot of you know amazing friends and 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 and, and dear colleagues you know incredibly passionate, incredibly talented, running these projects. So um so that's that's how I'm allowed to um that's how I'm able to actually do this. And I have a family as well. Um so so I need to also like you know you know uh, you know find time for that. So so you need to you need to you need to kind of um, create a formula, like a, a, a format rather than a formula, but a format that works for you. Because I mean, you know, what, what you can't do is like, you know, be expected to be in every service at every time. It's just impossible. Yeah, and you're going to yeah. kill yourself and you're going to, you know, and you're going to make everybody miserable. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so. so yeah. A juggling so, act. <laughs> it, is a jug, it is a juggling act, you know, and you put out fires a lot, but it's, but it's amazing. But you work with amazing people and, um, and everybody sort of believes in the, pro, you know, I mean, you know, Richard um, was the head chef at the firehouse. I mean, Bobby, I mean, you know, these, these are very dear friends of mine and people that I have a lot of respect for, uh, um, incredibly talented. I mean, like, you know, second to none in their knowledge of food. I mean, when you speak to, Bob, to Bobby about oysters, I mean, you know, he's an encyclopedia. I mean, I'm always learning from him. Yeah. So, um, so you have to, you know, I think you, we, we have to work like that. We have to, you know, create a, a team of friends and, uh, and colleagues and then, and, then, and then run like that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Bobby, how's the lockdown and reopening uh, of the world been for you? So, um, so firstly, uh, when, when the hospitality sector stopped in March, um, I went to a, a fishmonger's. I sort of moved sideways and um, I went to work at Notting Hill Fish Shop, which was uh, run by a chap called Krista Silver and Frederick Linforce. And Fred is like a 10 time UK oyster shucking champ. So um, I moved sideways. And so my, and my lockdown to answer that brief question was, was spent doing, you know, slicing up halibut and cod for people that are just chucking it in their freezers and stuff. So I had a very interesting lockdown where <laughs> I was still very much active in, in the fish industry. Um, and, it, and, you know, fishmongers became the sexiest thing in London. It was insane. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it was, the, the bakers, the, the fishmongers and the butchers, it, it was all essential food. Um, the wine guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. The wine, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, uh, my little drinks cabinets over there, but you can't see them. Um, yeah, so the, I, my lockdown was very, very busy, and, and I learned a lot from working with the, um, the fishmongers, and, and that was an incredibly awesome experience. Um, and then the, the reopening is, is uh, equally special and, um, and, and, you know, going, going very well. As, you know, it's been one week in now, but it's, it's going very well, and it's great to be shucking oysters again at the cart yeah and not, not putting them into little pots for people to take away to, to have at home <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you shuck oysters at a fish market, they, they want them open and then you have to put the lid back on and not lose any of the oh. juice and balance them in in the boxes and then oh really up. yeah and, and some some cycle that is a skill <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You, you have shucked oysters arriving within one hour like at your house. So you're putting them in the back of a motorbike and then just like hoping that they stay upright. <laughs> That's, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you can only do your job so far and then it's down to yeah. whoever's delivering the oysters <laughs> as to whether they look like they did when you put them in the box. Yeah. So, and obviously, uh, yeah, head of, head of oysters. What does that role involve for those of us who don't know? Although that might be a slightly obvious question. What does that involve at, 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 at the firehouse? Well, that, the Nuno um, is, I have Nuno to thank for that title. Um, it's, it's, it's in, essentially, <laughs> cool. I, I have, a, I have a, a, a section, just like a kitchen section. I have a section, but it's outside on, on a courtyard. And um, I'm responsible for purveying and um, buying, you know, world-class shellfish, predominantly oysters, but with um, some scallops and, and clams and stuff in there. And that we work alongside the chefs. Um, my, sorry, my team of shuckers work alongside Richard Foster and, and, and his team of chefs and Nuno. And we slot into the menu as the raw bar offering. Um, so essentially, I, I source the, the products, run it and make sure they're good. And of course, shellfish you know biology changes throughout the the year so you really need to be on top of it so that you get the best quality um shellfish 
uh, and and then doing the book research. I mean, I knew a lot of the guys anyway that I, I met in the book. But doing five thousand miles around the UK and Ireland, I've got a in depth knowledge now of each different oyster farm around the UK and Ireland, so we can apply that to the menu at Firehouse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had a, obviously had a look at the book, and you clearly are a fountain of knowledge when it comes to <laughs> to, to oysters and shellfish. Yeah, <laughs> I was led a lot of things I, uh, I had no idea about. So, so yeah, let's let's talk about the book. And obviously, you know, you've published books before as well. So, were you on hand for advice when Bobby went? This is I want to. I want to do this. This book. Um, I mean, only only on 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 uh, on um, emotional support and, and uh, <laughs> you know friendly emotional support, positive emotional support. But I mean, you know, he's missing you know. out. He's missing <laughs> out a crucial part of the whole story. Is that none none of this would have happened if I if I hadn't had a meeting with him in Spitalfield um, when we were talking about the menu. Actually, we we're talking about the seafood platter, and. Uh, he didn't um through through his your assistant wasn't it um he yeah. introduced me to my current agent uh, and and nuno and i <laughs> actually have the same literary agent now so um i mean the, uh, maybe the book would have happened another way but it definitely happened <laughs> through <laughs> through me and nuno sitting at that yeah. table okay um, yeah. and so and and it was just by pure chance the lady rachel mills her name is rachel mills literary was looking for new food narrative authors and i just happened to bring this up with with nuno at the same time and and it literally <laughs> happened like that it was it was it was it couldn't have worked perfectly so that's that's what nuno <laughs> did for the book <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. amazing how sometimes things just slot so perfectly into place yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely it was perfect timing brilliant and uh, the description of, of your book it, it says like you've already mentioned that you did five thousand mile journey around the coastline um of uh, of the uh, UK and, and Ireland on a Triumph mo motorcycle. Um, yeah. so it was <laughs> nice <laughs> Yeah, to you, I had to give it back. Oh, oh did you? Oh, no. Yeah. It, was, it, was a, it was a free, I borrowed it for free, uh, but I had to give it back. Uh, but they, right. they were, Triumph were awesome. They were like just, you know, it was covered in mud and sand and stuff every time I gave it back. And they were like, don't worry, we'll clean it up. And then gave it back to me with a full tank. And uh, it was awesome. Was that so, always the plan? I'm going to go look for different oysters and I'm going to do it on a motorbike. Uh, no, the plan, <laughs> the plan was to do, do the 5,000 mile journey because I could either do it from my house like we're how we are now chatting uh, but I, I would have felt that I was cheating the reader by not you know so there's only so much you can glean from the internet when when googling uh, what how Northumber Northumberland's coast looks like you have to go and be there it's like a restaurant isn't it the experience yeah. and everything you can so um, I, the only way I could possibly see doing it and in a cheap way was by doing it on a bike and so, and that way I'd get access down to the coast and stuff like that, and yeah. it wouldn't be uh, an issue. So that that's why I did it like that, um, uh, as well as being a motorcyclist. I just thought I'm just going to go and have an adventure. You're living the dream. You pick the best things, all the things you love, and you put them all into one thing. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 I'm very grateful. <laughs> um, and it also says here that you play um, the banjo. In a, in a folk an amazing band. player. I've yeah. seen him play. He's incredible. <laughs> really? Did you take the banjo on your five uh, five thousand mile journey? <laughs> no, the the banjo, deering banjos. They asked me if I could take it, and I was like, it was blapping down the M1 with a five string <laughs> banjo on the back. It's not going to work. Um, no, I, I play uh, I play five string banjo with with a, a guy called Beans on Toast, which is a bit like Billy Bragg meets Chaz and Dave. It's like okay. A, it's a big fe big festival um, act and. Um, so he always gets booked with like the punk rock bands and stuff like that. And, and that's another thing that Nuno and I have in common is we, we, we love our punk music. So, um, that's, yes. Oh, I thought you were going to say that Nuno plays the banjo as well then. I was going to say, no, oh, no, okay. no, 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 I wish I, no, no way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so why did you, um, I know you obviously said how the book came about, but why did you want to do a book about, uh, about oysters and, um, you know, what were you hoping that people would get from it obviously it's something that you love but how do you, you then you know engage that with an audience um uh, there's a couple of answers to this question uh, initially um there's a gap in the knowledge, uh, knowledge sorry, or there was a gap in the knowledge of um british and irish oysters um there's a few books out there like the london oyster guide and um the english the french and the oyster which deal with 
those specific things but there wasn't a holistic view of what's going on around the whole, all of the coasts and i like to include ireland in that because i don't care about politics when when you look at the the europe and this northwest corner of europe culturally we're very very similar britain and ireland um and so i wanted to do us collectively as a group of islands because it is england ireland scotland wales jersey guernsey um you know it's a, it's a load of islands when you look at it and take the politics out of it um so that needed to happen there was a gap in the knowledge and i'm going to tie in something with nuno in a second on that um secondly being an essex boy you, you're constantly defending where you come from because people always <laughs> slag off essex <laughs> and and as a kid i would always be at the market shucking oysters you know duke of york square market in chelsea doing three thousand oysters a day between three of us and i, I reckon 50 percent of the people were like where these are from essex you know where do these come from? are these french they'd always ask that question right. um and then when i got to firehouse and working with nuno and and the chefs um that kind of became exacerbated because you're with an international customer base and they would always be shocked or 50 percent of the people would be shocked that you, you britain had oysters particularly essex as well which is really famous with colchester and the romans and stuff so that was that and and also um i worked with uh my friends at uh, neil's yard dairy for a, a few christmases from 2010 to 2015 i'd always help them out because we were mates on the market it's one of the best independent food companies that has ever existed in london and um i was uh completely inspired about how they treated cheese british and irish cheese and if you look at the there's some dna of neil's yard dairy in in oyster isles if you open up the map on the second page you can see how um that list of places going around is very similar to when um neil's yard have like burkswell sheep's cheese cotswolds you know it's that same kind of um, meroir uh, in, with oysters uh, is the same with terroir with cheese and wine and I thought Neil's Yard Dairy did an incredible job uh, in the last 40 years of, of you know, promoting British and Irish cheese, which is world class, in my opinion. And um, they, they always get that, that French cheese thing as well. You know, they, they yeah. always get, um, and obviously French cheese is awesome, but that ties in with Nuno and something he said to me once. And it's, and it's the same kind of theme with this book is, is um, uh, Alentejo, the, the food from Alentejo um, versus just over the border to, to Spain, where the, the, you know, the pigs are fe feeding on the same acorns and it's the same kind of land, but Spanish ham gets that, all of that PR and, and, and Portuguese stuff doesn't, is not as well known. And this is something that Nuno champions all the time. And I, I, it's that same kind of thing that we like to promote awesome foods that should be well known, basically. Yeah. 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 And I, and I think, and I think it's a um, look. Uh, you know, one hundred percent. Just to compliment what, what, what you know, as, as Bobby is saying, I, mean, I think there's just a, a lack of knowledge, and I think that we need to educate. You know, I mean, I think in food we've really changed so much, and I think we've become fiercely local. And I think we've like we've now like you know, the UK has really become um, you know uh, respected for food. Uh, the British House have become respected for food, and I think that we we need to showcase that in, in our seafood. And I think you know we have over there um, in the UK and, and you know the, the product you know from the sea is incredible like second to none I mean like you know uh, well, just just about on par with Portugal I'd say so you buy some that shit I have to tell you but it, it is it is yeah it's, it's incredible and, and 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 I think that you know we need to scream and shout about it and we re you know we need to re-educate or, or try to educate or try to to you know, to make to make our guests experience them, to to give them a chance to experience the product, and then like uh, create an opinion, compare for themselves, you know. Yeah, I mean, you do mention in the book actually, Bobby, about that, um, like the loss of kind of like the importance of food provenance mm. over the years, um, and obviously that's it's so important. Like, how do you get? I mean, obviously things that you're doing, but how do you get that back? How do you make people more aware of where everything's coming from? That, uh, that quote was to do with um, the kind of, I like to say the microwave generation, but basically the Second World War up until, say, the 1990s or 1980s. Um, and that is, uh, I'd say it's, it's shifted now and it's changing. And people mm. like Nuno, who are celebrating awesome food, um, it's just getting it on the menu, isn't it, essentially? It's, yeah. uh, and and, and uh, getting people to try it. And, 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 and and banging on about it you know just sort of celebrating it and supporting those uh independent producers that are doing this awesome work and and 
and the the sh you can see the the shift in paradigm in the food and it's uh, I, I, th I say it's definitely happening and i hope that um oyster rails can add to that and people can use it as a little handbook to go and really explore uk and irish oysters yeah yeah and, and it's and it's also um look you know but and again you know come you know coming back to what we were saying before and you know when, when bobby was referencing you know uh, speaking about the orientation I mean, um, you know, in Portugal, we, had, we went through a, a period where there's very little visibility of the, the Portuguese the small independent producers, artisans. And, and as a result, they started dying off. So we, need to, we needed to start screaming and shouting about it. And, and there's a way for, you know, first of all, showcase the product that they're doing. And then also to try to preserve their, 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 their heritage and try to keep them going and keep them and reinvigorate them. And I think, uh, I think some of the, a lot of the fisheries need, I mean, you know, there's amazing fisheries around the UK around the aisles and, and, um, and, and, and they need, they need visibility, they need support, you know, and I think, you know, at a time, you know, in, in these times, I think we're becoming, you know, we have to also try to, you know, we have to support our neighbors, our friends, because we depend on them and they depend on us. So, uh, and, and they'll work as far as they can. They work, always work the extra mile to, to, to be there to support us. Yeah. So um, I think that's, that's uh, Bobby's mission as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going back to the pandemic uh, briefly, the uh, one positive upshot uh, which I saw firsthand from the fishmongers was that things like langoustines, which were landed in the port of Tyne in Newcastle, um, would be coming into London, which would normally go to um, Europe, to Runge's Market and to to northern Spain, uh, you know, crab that's normally uh, that lands in Ullapool that would normally go to China. All of these exports just dropped off a cliff in March. And I would see um, people from Notting Hill come in, buy two, <laughs> two like 900 gram lobsters and just, just ask us, how do I cook these? And we'd, we'd just quickly show them, cut, or we'll cut them in half for them. Then they go away, have these awesome lockdown barbecues, come back and show us the pictures. And you saw that with crab. Um, Palords is kind of a thing as Vongole is a, a popular dish but uh, you saw that with crab, langoustine and, and all of these brilliant UK fish, people trying turbots and sole and stuff at home. So that, that was one positive, uh, well huge positive of the, um, the pandemic I think. So that's another way, it's just literally getting it on the menu and getting it in front of people and um, I think exports will pick up again in the cup well next year perhaps but I, I i think for now we need to learn to consume these things domestically yeah. which did, which did happen in the 1800s and stuff like that particularly with oysters but then it just started to get bad press and overfished so yeah, yeah. we'll get there again and some people probably won't realize with with oysters that everyone used to eat oysters and it wasn't a delicacy it was something that everyone had didn't they yeah so, and that's something that a lot of people maybe don't realize yeah, it was like like when uh, in London in the on um, when you come out the tube at like two a.m. and there's a illegal hot dog stand um, <laughs> on the street. That that would have been an oyster oyster cart in the eighteen hundreds. Oh, I uh, wish that was still oyster carts. Yeah, at two in the well, well it, is, the it is happening. That we've got um, we have a dear friend uh, Connor uh, Oyster Boy, and he's oh, he's, he's, yes. chuck, he's chucking in Columbia Road um, and Broadway, and, and there's lots of different oyster things popping up around London but yeah it was a food of the poor and uh, in Ireland particularly it really helped sustain the coastal communities during the famine um, so limpets and, and razor clams and, and oysters that was a, a hugely important thing for Ireland um, and I guess um, since the onset of the hatcheries in the 1960s when farmers no, no longer need to re rely on wild settlement of oysters in the reefs they can buy seed as, as small as your fingernail, your little finger fingernail. Then they seed those in bags and then they know they've got, say, 10,000 or 10, 10 million oyster seed, if in the cases of places like Jersey. And they've got that stock and all they need to do is leave it there for two and a half years and, and, and it will come to maturity and then it goes to market. And it's, it's um, I think the, we'll, we are getting there again. We've launched the Staff Canteen Awards 2020. Nevermind Michelin stars and rosettes, 
this year's must-have accolade is our gold mug. The awards will be live on our Facebook page on November 18th, so save the dates. We'll be announcing categories and how to nominate soon, so keep an eye on our social channels and website for more info. All of the winners will be voted for and nominated by the public, so no judging panel, no stuffy dinner, and no expensive event ticket. TSC are breaking the mould. So come on, you all know you want a gold mug to add to your collection. Well, I mean, I, like I said, I learned a lot of things that I didn't know about oysters. So doing the book and researching, did you learn anything new? Because obviously you've worked with oysters your whole life, but did you, was there anything that particularly surprised you or that you were like, oh, I didn't know that or along uh, your, your, along your journey? I'd, I'd say oyster whites. <clears throat> I mean, you're, I'm always, we're always learning and, and, and uh, I, I was always learning every single day while I was going around doing the book, but um, oyster wise, I, I kind of knew a lot of it was turning up uh, at the uh, oyster farm and people would be in the middle of a big busy day and I'd have to be this annoying little guy sort of like, do you mind if I interview you quickly? Mm-hmm. And, and so, so I, I, I learned a lot about how to sort of extract information uh, and data and stuff like that and do like a condensed country file in half an hour and then get out of there and then go and do another one uh, oyster wise I, I pretty much knew what was going on generally because I've, I've worked in the oyster industry from you know down on the farm in, in mold and purification export and stuff um, I think what I really gleaned from the extra bits was just how stunning the British coast is you know particularly when you get up into Oban and the Hebrides, uh, yeah. Scotland, it's just unbelievable. And, and the amount of stuff going on there is just awesome. It's just about, I think, the UK government. In fact, there is a, a thing called um, Seafood 2040 where they're promoting uh, uh, mussels and oysters um, as a high-protein source of sustainable um, aquaculture so in the next couple of years you, you, you will see more and more of it and, and and the authorities getting behind it um, I guess the other thing I learned as well is that there is a, a huge breakdown in, in communication between water companies private water companies and the coast and that's one thing that we really need to watch um, so people like surfers against sewage down in Cornwall are doing amazing campaigning um, to highlight the fact that these private water companies are just dumping waste into the into the the river systems and it's not going uh, it's not being noticed and, and they're not getting penalized and that's a huge thing on the horizon that we need to watch um, so there's lots of things like that I saw um, uh, yeah, I learned, uh, there's too many things to name, uh, that I, that, too many <laughs> things that I learned along the way. But um, yes, there was, uh, I guess the most important thing is that you have the oyster man, you have the government, you have um, uh, na- the, the nature conservation person and the local councillor all having the same conversation and that we in the restaurant end of it know what's going on so we can be a part of it and we can vote with with uh, with um, with where we're buying shellfish and stuff like that. And so... I guess uh, a, a sort of coordinated attack or approach on all of these things is what I learned. So that was the most powerful thing. And where that works really well is places like Pool, Pool Harbour, where the guy Gary Wordsworth is on, on the board of the inshore fisheries and he knows what's going on and stuff. Um, yeah, there's loads of things I learned. Sorry, I'm rambling. No, no, that's fine. Right. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well actually a question to both of you then um so w- what is your favorite uh oyster from the from the uk and ireland nuno do you have a favorite oh it's really hard to say though because i mean you know like i mean so every time like you know uh, you know bobby <laughs> bobby bobby um you know you know I, I i'm not every day at the firehouse but uh but when i am you know like and, and bobby's there as well like you know he always brings he always brings oysters from from you know like you know and depending on the season, depending on the day, it's like, look, try this one today. And they're, they're you know, it's like asking what my favorite food is. It's, it's a very hard <laughs> question to answer because every day, like, you know, some days I really want to eat something really Portuguese or something really Japanese. It doesn't matter. So, but I mean, but the things that I've tasted, I mean, um, from Bobby, like are absolutely incredible, incredible specimens. I think um, one, the, one of the best things, that, uh, one of the best collaborations, or in fact, it's not a collaboration, it was your, it was your recipe, Nuno, was, um, and it was, it was when we, 
we do a dressed oyster, uh, not at the moment, but normally there'll be a dressed oyster on the menu and we'll ch rotate it, you know, depending on what's come into season. And it was such a cool thing. We had a, a Butley Creek oyster, which was from Suffolk. And sometimes we did a River Teen from Devon, um, mm. which are both grown on the bottom of the river. So um, uh, it's not aquaculture in bags. It's like this plump river, uh, river oyster that gets fished up. Um, and Nuno put um, some priorat, uh, what was it? It was um, like pan tamaka yeah, um, like with the salt and then uh, the olive oil to finish. And it's yeah. so simple and so awesome. And that was one of our most popular dressed oysters we ever did. Yeah. It's just, yeah. uh, I mean, and I think, I, th I believe we use British tomatoes as well. So like, you know, just, just grating really nice, fresh uh, British tomatoes, like, you know, in the peak of the season. Um, and just with the extra, extra virgin olive oil and, and a little bit of a touch of salt, I think it was. And that was it. Or yeah. Lime zest, I think, at times, yeah. Finish with mold, mold and salt. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. we, we did a really lordy one once, which was, uh, <laughs> uh, it was a giant river teen. So it was about 120 yeah. grams, about the size of my hand. Um, <laughs> and, and then, we uh, grated foie gras on it, uh, put some trout roe, and then a little bit of lime zest. That was so, <laughs> so, 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 so lordy. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's more for fun. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so do you have a favourite then, then Bobby, or, or, or do you just... I've got to be so, that too hard? so diplomatic <laughs> when I answer this question. Um, <laughs> uh, the, I, I think um, throughout the season, as we said earlier, um, oysters change differently so in spring and autumn the wild ones uh, which are normally grown on the bottom or just on the beach they are in perfect uh, condition and very plump full of meat um, so I guess in springtime I would like a river teen or I'd love a you know Whitstable pearl or West Mersey rock um, and we're about to go into native oyster season and so there are indigenous oyster which is the brown disc shaped one on the front cover of the paperback um, so that will be my hometown, Malden. I mean, that's famous for uh, famous for salt, famous yeah. for oysters. Um, the Colchester and the Mersey. Just if you go a bit further out on the Blackwater, that's a stunning uh, flat oyster. The the two sort of the the, the most special native area in in the UK is actually um, so it is is the Fowl. So that's where they they fish the oysters down in Falmouth. Um, and they're not allowed motorboats there. It's a traditional method where you have to just fish under sail and oar. So it's just wind power and hand power that has to get the oysters. Okay. So, and that is a really small season. And so if you can get a foul native, um, you know that it's come from uh, an extremely sustainable way of fishing. And um, in October, that's going to be incredible. Yeah. Um, a Galway native as well in October. I think you're um, just naming all of them now, Bobby. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't say. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna annoy somebody by not saying them. I know. Like, what about mine? <laughs> yeah, but there's, there's some awesome uh, Portuguese oysters as well. Um, we, we, uh, Aqua Nostra is a, a rock oyster that we, we got in as a sample at Firehouse once, and then um, it's, a, it's in Set, Setubal, isn't it? Is that how you Setubal, say it? yeah. There's, yeah. there's an oyster, yeah, from a Moinho dos Ilhéus, which is in a, a little island off of Faro, which is incredible. Here, Formosa, again, um, stunning, stunning. I mean, like, yeah, there's some really nice things. Some things from the Aveiro as well uh, region. Yeah, some very, very special oysters from here, yeah. yeah. The, the Portuguese are actually credited with bringing over the rock oyster from Macau. Um, there's a few theories about how the rock oyster, which is the most popular oyster in the world, um, they're, they're credited with bringing it over to Portugal um, you know, a couple of hundred years ago and then that coming over. There's an old piece from the UK government in an in a a, old newspaper clipping that says the Portuguese oyster um, and you can buy it here and it's like from the 1800s. And, that, and that's, yeah, that's the rock oyster that we, um, uh, that we, use, that we use in the, in the UK. There's a, there's a lot of sort of a um, few different stories about how it happened, but one of them is that um, Macau and the Portuguese sailors are credited with bringing the rock oyster over. There's so much history and the stories and stuff behind everything. Like the, I love some of the the stories that are in that are in your book. It must have been great, like meeting those people that have you know their whole lives revolve around it, don't they? And generations have yeah have, yeah have, have put the work into into this. So. Yeah, they're they're all life, like friends now as well, and we all chat about stuff and and uh, support each other if there's things going on. And yeah, it's it's uh, it's incredible the upshot of doing the whole thing. Um, and so, uh, if you've never tried oysters before, what would you both recommend 
uh, to start with. Some people are still quite hesitant about things like oysters if they've never had them. They don't know how to eat them. They don't know what they should eat them with. Should they just have them as they are? Some people like them cooked. So what would you say if you, you're a first timer when it comes to oysters? Uh, what would you recommend? Chef, you want to go first? Well, look, I mean, you know, I, I, and I think, you know, with Bobby, a lot of times that, you know, when we start, to, you know, when we taste oysters, I mean, I always like to taste like, you know, the actual product, you know, itself before you start adding stuff to it, you know, or just try to keep it as simple as possible. So, I mean, I, I, you know, for me, like, I mean, you know, to capture the essence of the oyster, like you have to just eat it by itself, you know, just eat, eat the oyster with the juices and nothing else, you know, at the right temperature. Uh, and then we start from there and then you can start, you know, looking at it, adding, adding condiments to it, etc. But I mean, for me, it's always like just, just a, a nice and a lot of times, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I go to, I go to Oysters car, um, to, to Bobby's, to Bobby's cars and I'm like, look, you know, like I just try to taste a couple of voices like in the morning. It's so nice. It's just like, it's, it's, it's wonderful. That, that's where it all starts. And your palate is so clean, especially in the morning when you taste this. And, uh, and uh, so, so I always prefer to start like that. That's, I, I would agree as well, because oysters filter 80 to 100 litres or 30 to 50 gallons a day per oyster. So it tastes of where it comes from, which is the whole fuss yeah. about oysters and why you have like a mini wine list when you've got an oyster list. So I'd 100% agree with Nuno. Um, drink, hold it by the hinge of the shell, the pointy bit. Drink some of the liquor first so you can prepare your, your palate and then, it, then uh, chew the oyster and, and enjoy it. And next level up, sprinkle of lemon. Uh, native yeah. oysters, always just lemon. Uh, don't muck around with those. And if you want, want to dress an oyster, just make sure it's elevating the actual taste yeah. of, of the of oyster course. and not just masking it. Real um, lemon, not Jif lemon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I, in Scarborough, Trust I had that in Scarborough. Yeah. Say that. <laughs> what the hell is that? It was, that? A, it was a great story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Lemon in the bottle. Huh? <laughs> yeah. For people that are listening and haven't read the book, tell that story about the, <laughs> about the oysters. Um, so we, I was in Scarborough with my brother, Mike, and we were down on the seafront, and it's a cl um, you know, classic scene with donkey rides going on and British sea seaside and the and the um uh the fun fair going on and we went to a fish van and mike asked for an oyster and i said where's it from and the lady said from grimsby but grimsby is just a massive fishing port uh and it hasn't had um wild oyster beds since the 1900 early 1900s um and so i said oh, i can't be from grimsby it's just a fish market and i realized i was erring on the side of being a punt so, so like you know I was just like <laughs> I, ne I needed to just get i needed to just shut up and so she looked at me and she just said they're from grimsby and then um and then looked at my brother mike and was like would you like some lemon love and he was like yes please and she got a squeezy lemon bottle out and and just squirted this uh jiff all over the oyster and then he ate mm. it uh, he said it, he said it was amazing but um i just had to be quiet and stop being a, a, a busybody yeah. <laughs> that was that situation <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and, uh, in the book as well it, it's not you know it's not just about the different oysters and the stories behind them there's also you've got um you pairings there's some uh, recipes there's a list of places to go um and and, and eat them and that's kind of the, the nutritional value behind them as well so what what is how nutritional are oysters that's like i've never really broken it down that much other than i love oysters i eat them i never really think about that side of it they extremely nutritious they're high in zinc um they're <clears throat> full of omega-3 which we don't naturally produce in our bodies uh, which we need to get from oily fish and oysters um there's about four four five six grams of protein per oyster so you know 12 oysters is under 100 calories and almost as much as a 100 gram steak so there's there's loads of things um going on with an oyster and it's it's a superfood you know it's it's the new avocado and it's um <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's local as well which is great. yeah <laughs> indeed and and most importantly they they filter the water so they're actually good for the environment so sometimes when i approach a table and i've got a wild oyster a native oyster and a farmed or aquaculture oyster um someone will turn their nose up at oh they're farmed because they're thinking of like chickens and beef and and things like that uh, or or crops certain you know unorganic crops and um aquaculture is the opposite and that's something that the uk government needs to really ham home is that the if an oyster's filtering 100 liters per day and you've got 10,000 oysters out on a on a river 
um, it's cleaning the environment, it's creating microhabitats, um, it's eating free food from the sun. The sun makes the phytoplankton, it filter feeds the phytoplankton, and the farmer just takes it out two years after. So it's it's so good for the environment, and I think we need to start turning our attention to the foreshore to you know get this amount of protein. Yeah. Um, and you can do loads of things with them. I'm sorry, historically on the Chesapeake Bay in in um, America, they would put them in tins. You get tinned oysters, like when you get the John West tuna in in cost cutter. You, you can actually get little tinned oysters as well. Um, and you know, oil, uh, smoked oysters in oil is one of the best things ever. I, I love it. It's like a, a velvety little taste. It's really cool. I've never so tried that. <laughs> we just need to go ham on this and and get everyone healthy and and eating free food basically from the sun. Yeah, um, and Nuno, obviously you're there at the conception of the idea of this book, and now you've seen this book. Is this something that all chefs should get their hands on and they should have a, <laughs> a read of? I think not just chefs, you know, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think a lot of chefs, I mean, I think we need to learn a lot more. I mean, like obviously in a lot of restaurants, we serve oysters. So, I mean, our knowledge of voices is still very poor. I think we still, as Bobby said, I think there's still like kind of like that sort of that, that old, like, oh yeah, let's just get some French oysters or, you know, like, I mean, you know, not understanding what the, what the, what the British Isles have to offer in terms of oysters. Um, and I, but again, I mean, I think, I think it's just a amazing general knowledge. I mean, it's a beautiful book. Um, it's an entertaining book to read, um, educational. And I think it's, you know, I, th I think a lot of people, not just in the industry, need to also learn a little more and, uh, and champion um, our British horses, you know, the local yeah. horses. Yeah. And having both written books, uh, is it something you would want to do again or um, would you stick, rather stick to the day job? <laughs> is, it, is it harder than it looks? <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a commitment. For my life. I need to get a try on for my next one. Shit. I didn't get a bike. <laughs> yes. I'm learning from you, Bobby. Thank you. Uh, I'd definitely yeah. like to, uh, uh, I'd definitely like to do some more stuff. Yeah. It definitely takes it out of you. Once you've done, once it comes out, you sort of like just lay, lay down like that. Like, Oh my word. It's like having homework every night for two nights, for two, two nights, for, for, two, year, for two years. Um, so I'd come home from service at midnight, half midnight, right till 3 a.m., 4 a.m., hear the birds singing, and then go to bed, wake up, proofread, go to work. And that's how, after I'd done the trip, that's what the sort of writing section was like. So it's a, it's a proper commitment. And I guess Liz Boetta, Nuno's book, which I've got up there, um, oh. is, uh, was, was the same. And yeah. there's, there's so much information in that. I mean, it's such a good book. Yeah. I mean, it's a labor. I mean, I think books these days, I mean, they're, they're a labor of love. You know? Like, you know, neither of us, like, I, you know, neither of us made a book to, you know, for the financial reward of it. We, 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 we wrote books because, we, you know, we're very passionate about the, the subject matter. Um, and we wanted to explore it and we wanted, you know, to, to, to you know, share it with, the, with our readers. So, um, but yes, but it is, it is, um, it is an, un it's an undertaking. But yeah, but one that I um, I really enjoyed actually. I mean, and it, it it pushed me. I think I think these things they push you, um, they force you into situations. They 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 take you out of your comfort zone. And I think it's a, and there's a lot of reward with that. And I think you learn and you grow as a result of that. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to do you know, and hopefully we'll do more. And I'm sure Bobby will do. He's got some cup, something up his sleeve as well. Yeah, the I think the as Nuno said the the reward side of it it's it's what was absolutely amazing to see was was different um people taking the book to the coast and and using the the extensive restaurant guide at the back and and sending me pictures of holding it up next to like a craggy shore in ireland and <laughs> stuff and 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 that um and that sort of uh emotional transaction if you like between the reader and the author is is just it's incredible and um to just see people doing a service to the industry, which is it's all from a a, a place of, of love and it's not, not to make loads of money. It's not about that at all. That's what Nuno just said. Um, just to see it being used and, and making a positive impact, you know, from the Shellfish Association of Great Britain to the restaurants, to the oyster farmers reaching out and stuff. And that's, that's, why I did it and and if there's a, a reason to do another one again I would love to do one I'm not just gonna do one willy-nilly yeah yeah 
Well, it's a, a brilliant book, and I look forward to uh, if there is another one finding out what your mode of transport will be for, uh, <laughs> for, for book number two. So. <laughs> um, thank you both so much. Like, it's been it's been great to talk to you, um, and I'm sure I'll speak to you both soon. Um, and yeah, good luck with uh, opening. Nuno and um, um, Bobby, thanks again. And everyone thank can get your book. They can go get go get your book now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Cara. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this interview. And if you have any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And if you want to support us to continue creating great content with amazing people from the hospitality industry, please take a look at our contribution scheme on www.thestaffcanteen.com. This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.